When I first started my decluttering journey, having a clutter-free home was at the top of my list. But one thing I wanted more than that was a clutter-free headspace with less overwhelm, less anxiety, and far more clarity. But I wasn't sure how to do that. You know, decluttering my physical space, the clothes in my closet, that stuff was easier to deal with than everything in my head. So that's what I focused on, right? Like most people on this journey. And when it came to my headspace, it felt like an afterthought. And that's why this is the clutter we should worry about because in my opinion, the implications of not decluttering our headspace are pretty serious. Now, journaling and writing poetry were the two things I did to help me navigate my headspace, my mental clutter. And I've been journaling and writing poetry for 15 years now, so I've had some success with it. It's, it's helped quite a bit, which is huge, right? But it started to feel redundant and less effective over time. So as you can imagine, the overwhelm, the anxiety, all of those things lingered. However, I eventually noticed that the reason for this was because I was writing within the bounds of a very limited emotional vocabulary. And I say that because I remember finishing journal entries or poems that I would take days to write. And at the moment of completion, I felt accomplished. I was proud of myself as I should be, right? Because I just worked through something that occupied a ton of headspace. It contributed to my mental clutter. You know, I'm sitting there thinking that I'm finally getting somewhere here, right? But after that initial excitement or a glimpse of progression, let's say, I was quickly knocked back when I discovered that the clutter was still there because the overwhelm was still there. The stress was still there. The anxiety was still there. The fears were there. And I was genuinely confused because it felt like journaling and poetry worked and then it didn't work. <laughs> and that was frustrating because my physical space was becoming clutter free relatively quickly at that. Right. And I just wanted to experience that same thing in my headspace. So I got curious and I wanted to figure out why. Why was writing only working some of the time? And that's when I uncovered the idea or the possibility that maybe my emotional vocabulary was limited and I needed to learn how to build it up. So I kept digging and digging and digging and soon realized that this is something that a lot of people struggle with, not only in their writing, but also in conversation. You know, I've come to understand that words for emotions have gradually been used more and more to mean different things until they have taken on broad and vague meanings. An easy example is the word happy. I've read that happy has become an umbrella term for anything positive to the extent that nobody really knows if what they are feeling qualifies as happy. If I feel passionate, am I happy? If I feel calm and content, am I happy? If I feel inspired and energized, is that happy? Now, the thing that has changed the game for me when it comes to writing and decluttering my headspace, if you haven't guessed by now, has been building up my emotional vocabulary. The more new words I can equip myself with to help me differentiate between feelings, the more options my brain has to help make sense of all of this. The various sensations and emotions collectively known as my mental clutter. Because here's a secret we're not exposed to. When you can have a more accurate word for a feeling, it helps to regulate your emotions. It helps you to declutter your headspace and in turn, it means less stress, less overwhelm, less anxiety, less clutter, obviously, in your body and in your mind. Now, learning how to do this is very simple and I have three quick ideas for you to consider. The first is learning from others. Now, when it comes to building up our emotional vocabulary, there's only so much that we can do on our own, right? Which is why it's important that we learn from the people and the things around us. Whether it's the books we read, the music we listen to, the movies we watch, if we just observe the language that these people are using, whether it's the directors, the actors, the artists, the authors, if we observe the language, the words that they are using, then that gives us so much information and so many new words that we can then pull from to help us build up our emotional vocabulary. Now, something that I did personally, because I love poetry, is I also read and listened to other poets with the intent to observe their word choice and really figure out why they chose to describe a certain language in a certain way. 
And what that did for me is it gave me, like I said, so many new words, so many new techniques, so many new ideas. So then when it was time for me to sit down and journal and work through my headspace, declutter my mental clutter, I now had so many new words to pull from and so many new ways to explain and describe how I was feeling. The next idea I would suggest is getting specific. Whenever you start to feel something, especially when journaling, challenge yourself to go beyond, I feel sad, as an example. Because from the perspective of decluttering your headspace, sad is only going to get you so far. So what other words can you use to describe this feeling or this physical sensation you're experiencing? Is it loneliness? Is it a sense of emptiness? Is it boredom or guilt? Do you feel powerless or vulnerable? Is it insecurity? See, when you're specific in your word choice, that then changes the context of the conversation you're having with yourself through journaling and therefore giving you so much more control, so much more power to push forward, to make progress when it comes to decluttering your headspace. The third idea is to challenge yourself. Whenever you're out exploring new experiences with a group of friends or your family, whether it's a food festival and you're trying different foods or a museum or anything for that matter, challenge yourself to play around with the ways in which you describe those experiences in conversation. Because the more practice you get at building up and growing your emotional vocabulary in a public setting like this through conversation with people you know and don't know, the easier it's going to be in your private time to do that same thing when you're having conversations with yourself through journaling and decluttering your headspace, right? So just think about it like this. Each and every new experience you have is an opportunity to view things from a different perspective and to describe them in a new way. Keep growing in your journey, my friend. Keep learning and always remember to stay true to you. See you in the next one. Peace.